Hello, everyone, and welcome to My Path to Leadership, Leadership Activity. My name is Kevin Weeder, and I will be facilitating this event. Today, we are here to listen and talk with Mr. Chris Ronane, candidate for Cuyahoga County Executive. For today's event, I have some questions for Mr. Ronane about his time in public service, his advice and leadership, as well as his vision for Cuyahoga County. Finally, we will wrap up with some questions from other students in the audience. Welcome, Mr. Ronane, and thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Without further Thanks, delay, everybody. Mr. Ronane, I'd like to start off by having you tell us a little bit about your story. Can you tell us about yourself and your journey? Sure, and it's good to be with all of you today. Thanks for being here, and I am Chris Ronane. I'm currently a uh, candidate for Cuyahoga County Executive, as you know. Um, my personal story, um, I'll start from the beginning. I was born in the city of Chicago, moved to Cleveland when I was 10 years old, so I am a uh, now proud Clevelander most of my life. Um, but I spent, first of all, my undergraduate days uh, studying business at Miami of Ohio, uh, but I admittedly got a little bored in the undergraduate days and applied to do something different. I applied for a semester abroad uh, and that ended up in Luxembourg, which was... Uh, a really, really interesting journey for me, one, because we were studying international business, but what I was doing also was studying cities. Uh, the cities uh, that I could get to on a Eurail pass and a <clears throat> thin budget took me to places that I'd only read about and only dreamed of being at, but being in places like Paris and Brussels, uh, Berlin, uh, I started to really, really fall in love with what cities were all about and how they worked. Um, and I was inspired to get into uh, something that could help me, <clears throat> help my city, Cleveland, uh, grow and prosper and run as an efficient city. So I actually went back <clears throat> to city planning uh, and ended up in graduate school right here at Cleveland State University at the Levin College. And uh, I studied the field of city planning. Uh, it was a field that I loved then and I love now, and I became a city planner. <clears throat> On the public service front, uh, I was a graduate assistant for a gentleman named Norman Krumholtz, who was essentially planning director for uh, three very different mayors, Carl Stokes, uh, Dennis Kucinich, and Ralph Perk, um, and all very different in their own right. One of those three mayors came into our class one day, just like this, and uh, Mayor Stokes moderated a cities and films class. I knew a little bit about the history of Mayor Stokes, and in an aisle like that, he was walking out after class, and I said, uh, Mayor, would you ever have coffee with a student? And that was me asking if he'd have coffee with me. He said, yeah, I'm usually at the Arabic out on Shaker Square on Saturdays, 10, about 10 o'clock in the morning. If you, if, you, if you come up, I'll probably be there. So <laughs> there I went to see uh, the famed Mayor Carl Stokes, and I was probably a student by your age, um, and we had coffee. And I don't remember everything he said during the course of that exchange, because I was kind of in awe thinking about the fact that I was with Mayor Stokes, the first African-American mayor of a major American city, and a guy who really put the end to the Cuyahoga River fires. But I do always remember the last thing he said, and he said something that both haunts me and motivates me. He said, change comes in inches. Change comes in inches in Cleveland. Uh, and I never forgot that because I think he was basically saying that progress happens too slowly in our town. Uh, but I took it as a motivation to get into public service and do something about it. So that fusion of studying cities and hearing from a leader that we ought to catalyze change faster motivated me to get into public service. I went on to be uh, the planning director of the city of Cleveland. Uh, I worked a campaign with my then boss, Mayor Campbell, ran her first campaign for mayor, like my friend Zoe and our colleague David are running my campaign for county exec. And then the last 16 years, I worked in University Circle, uh, heading up uh, the cultural district, education, medical arts, and cultural district, essentially in a city manager role. But it was that love and study of cities and those motivating words of Mayor Stokes that got me interested in a life of public service. That's awesome. Yeah. So what have been the building blocks to your success? Well, I think being a listener leader is really, really important. Um, we, we really, really learn if we listen uh, from history and those who come before us. 
Um, I, I'm, I'm a believer, and I guess I've been doing that since sitting down with Mayor Stokes, um, that you really, really need to know where we've been if we have any sense of where we're actually going. Um, and so I, I listen a lot to those who've already served in public service. I was out for lunch yesterday with a former county commissioner, Commissioner Tim Hagan, um, just learned a lot from him uh, as he endeavored to help the health and human service agenda of Cuyahoga County. The other thing I do is I listen to people in nonprofits, organizations, for-profits, everybody in town. Somebody said that this campaign is one um, giant interview. Uh, you've heard of the listening tour. It's kind of what we have been doing. Uh, we know this town. I've worked in this town my whole adult life. But I'm listening to the details of what people do on matters of everything you can imagine, infant mortality, food insecurity, economic development, infrastructure. Uh, there's people and organizations that work on all of that in our town. And uh, so I try to apply this listener leadership um, to get to where we're going and, and help build off of what others have already built. You spent your career in public service, as you mentioned in your yeah. um, bio. Uh, why is civic engagement important to you, and how do you plan to engage younger people to become more civically engaged? Great, great question. Um, the civic engagement, um, I think that the best government governs uh, by way of really, really, truly engaging its citizenry. Uh, government doesn't govern in a vacuum. Those that have, frankly, I think are some of the worst in history, right? Those that think it's my way or the highway um, end up being really, really bad leaders, right? Those who listen, grant you, make decisions, got to make decisions once in a while too. Um, but I think, I think the best are, are those that listen. I'm going to use a quick example and then get to the second part of the question about young leadership. Um, but when I was the city planning director for Cleveland, I spent uh, four very fun years in that job. Basically, imagine a job where you, you essentially shape your city of the future, right? So our project that was most major in our uh, portfolio at the time was the Cleveland Lakefront Plan. And we were working on basically better access and connection points to the lake, which, as you know, is still a work in progress. One of the better things we did was recommend that the Metro Parks take on the lakefront as the park system of choice. And so we relieved the state of its obligation, and we brought the Cleveland Metro Parks, and it's gotten better ever since. But I wanted to say to you guys, uh, we had 5,000 people participate in the Cleveland Lakefront Plan. And I'll remember everything from the 300 public engagements we had over the course of three years. I remember a group, <laughs> no kidding, surfers that engaged us about Lake Erie. I didn't even know they surfed in Lake Erie until I met with the surfers, right? We met them one night uh, in the warehouse district, and they came from Buffalo, they came from Toledo, Detroit. Who are you people, right? What, what, are, you, what are we doing here? But just two days ago, I saw surfers surfing at Edgewater. The reason they wanted to meet with us is they saw in our plan a pier that we had put in the plan that was going to, quote, in their words, break their fetch. And I thought that was kind of funny because I had to learn what a fetch even was. But, but the idea was that we had a stakeholder group who enjoyed the lake because of the uni unique wave activity on the Edgewater Park shoreline. And they came from three different states to get here. So listening to people about our lakefront plan really made sense. On a bigger scale, we listened to about 500 people who wanted to see 88 acres north of Rockefeller Park get converted into a bird sanctuary. And today, that's the lakefront nature preserve that's managed by the port. But we saved it in the plan to be a park. And that was listening to the voices of those who participated in the lakefront plan. And all in all, we had 5,000 participants, and we logged everybody's voice on a spreadsheet and every comment they'd made. I think that's real engagement, not just a minute at the mic of public input for the sake of checking the box that we had public input. It's about really listening to what people really want. Um, my mother passed away last year, and the last great walk I took was in that park that the citizens 500 strong wanted, 88 acres. And my mom loved birds and nature, so last great walk I had with her was there. It's meaningful to me, too. But it was the people that drove that. So transitioning to young people in our campaign and in civic uh, contribution generally, one thing I'll say, uh, we learned from the Chicago Lakefront Plan that they started teaching the Lakefront Plan in the Chicago s schools as a way, this is in the city of Chicago, and their plan that happened actually at the turn of the 20th century around the time of the Chicago World's Fair. But they taught it in the schools because they wanted their students to be the future stewards of the Chicago Lake Line. I thought that was pretty smart. I think we should do more of that. I actually want to take 
uh, Cleveland's waterfront and claim the freshwater capital here and get younger learners you know, that are in, in uh, K through eight to understand the value of fresh water so that they can be the ecological stewards of the future, right? And we even were at the City Club last week and a young lady from uh, Campus International High School got up and talked about, to the US EPA director, uh, questions about fresh water. And he said, I want to engage you in a youth council. This is President Biden's US EPA secretary saying this to a high school student from Cleveland. I gave her my card and I said, if they don't get back with you because it's kind of complicated at a federal level to engage a youth council, we want you here. We want to work with you in our future administration as a youth council. So I wanted to say that. I also wanted to say you have to live by example. So the average age on my campaign uh, is, what Zoe, 25 or younger? 27. You're not even 25 yet. Our average age is 27. Zoe's our field director and she's 24 and almost a few days to 25. But um, we have to live by example. So to have an average age of 27, which is half my age, uh, is a good thing. First of all, you listen to next generation ideas. Second, there's energy. And third, there's stewardship. So I think you have to live by the example of hiring younger people, right? Um, we also want to say to you, anybody wants to get involved in a campaign this summer, see Zoe. I almost kind of give her the mic here uh, and talk more about youth engagement. But we were just talking about on the way down here, you're probably age-wise above, quote, youth, but you're young adult, and we want young adult and youth engagement. So we are engaging high school students, but we're engaging early 20-somethings on this campaign because, again, my goal is to implement your ideas um, at large, you know, as I'm speaking, um, wherever you are politically. My goal is to, en to engage ideas and implement them. Um, and then finally, in the administration, we need to hire young people into our administration. And for those that we don't hire, I think we do have to have young professionals counsel. We have to have high school and co college age counsels because um, otherwise we're pretty stagnant, you know? I really believe that people coming up generationally are the future, and we need to be tracking what the trends that they're interested in. So, and also intergenerationally, we learn from each other, you know. Well, as a young adult, yeah. I like that answer a lot. Good, good, so, good. <laughs> in addition okay. to being engaged in civic life, uh, you've also been a leader. Most recently, the executive director of University Circle Incorporated. Can you describe how your past experiences being a leader shaped you into the kind of leader you are today? And drawing on your own experience, what is the most important message or advice you have for aspiring leaders? Sure. Well, in the world that I'm in, in, in civic leadership, um, and, and particularly in the public service, um, I believe that public service that serves best does listen. I also, I'm gonna say this perhaps controversially, I think the government, government that governs best kind of finds the center. And I'm just gonna say that's the kind of person I am. We do in primary fights have people at the margins you know, yelling as loud as they can with the most sort of, I guess, out in the outer bell ideas, which is fine. But when you get to governing, you have to govern for everybody. You have to govern whether you're an independent, a Democrat, a Republican, or other. I have to govern for all, right? And um, I'm a Democrat running as an endorsed Democrat, but I, I'm cognizant that I need to you know, work with all. I'll be at the City Club day after tomorrow at Senator Portman's speech. He's a Republican, Democrat, Republican. We gotta sort of work our way to the center to govern, my opinion. Um, the other thing I wanna say in sort of civic work, uh, Mayor Daley of Chicago, my birth city, once said this to me. He said, cities are about big picture and small, and, and, uh, small details the big picture and small details. I believe that. I believe that's the foremost uh, consideration for Mayor Bibb, uh, that he's got big picture ideas he's got to implement. I spoke with him yesterday about a few of those big ideas. Um, he's got big, big ideas, but he also has to deal with cracks in the sidewalks, right? He has to deal with small issues. And um, it's kind of that management of where are we going in the big picture, that freshwater capital, but what are we doing to make sure that Mrs. Miller uh, doesn't make the choice between uh, food issues and medicine, right? That's not even a small issue. It's just those are the details, right? So I think big picture and details, kind of you have to manage both. Um, and as far as like what helped me personally get where I'm going, I keep going back to that learning from the experiences of those who came before. Because we really, I, have, I think, have to have the humility to realize that um, you know, it's a trajectory in time. And we're, we're working from where somebody else left off 
and we're working to eventually hand that baton to somebody else, and hopefully a little better than the last uh, you know, time we, we, we picked it up. Um, we've got a big, big challenge in society right now, uh, which is, I think, to really bridge um, our communities together to learn from some of the wrongs of our past and to create a more inclusive and equitable future. Uh, I think any major metro struggles with that, uh, that, they, that, that there is really a, uh, a, a past uh, where there's been great disparity and, and to do our best to bring um, sort of a more inclusive prosperity. A lot of that's just listening to where we've been in the past and thinking about creating a new future. So staying on the leadership topics, you have been a leader in many organizations. Uh, just to name a few for our audience, he was on the board of Destination Cleveland, um, chair of the Canalway Partners Board of Directors, and past chair of the Port of Cleveland Board of Directors. How have these innovative projects inspired your vision for Cuyahoga County moving forward? Sure, well, one, I'm a big believer that um, you know, we all have one shared interest and in it's quality of life. You know, um, we're lucky to be born where we are. Um, you, you may disagree with that, but I think generally looking around the globe, uh, being born in the Great Lakes region, having access to fresh water, um, and, and, and lest we spoil it, clean air, and just things that are the basics of life, but not everybody even enjoys that. We are, we are, we are lucky, so I think to some degree, we have to really, really make the most of the quality of life baseline that we do have and ensure that we maintain quality of life and improve it for those who need it improved here um, in Cuyahoga County. But um, what I guess taking a few of those uh, pieces apart and boards I've served, the Canalway Partners is the group that's brought to bear the Towpath Trail. It's a 100-mile trail that connects uh, downtown Cleveland to Akron vis-a-vis essentially the contours of the Cuyahoga River for the northern stretch and uh, along what was formerly a uh, canal uh, years and years ago in the Industrial Revolution when, they, when the canal boats would uh, come through uh, Ohio. And so we created this heritage trail. And it's one of uh, uh, about 50 national heritage areas uh, that runs through the Cuyahoga National Park. OK, I've gone a little long about this 100-mile trail. But what it does is it provides a quality amenity for your quality of life, right? You can get out if you haven't been on that trail, ride it, walk it, enjoy nature, enjoy industrial heritage all along this, this path. Something we can really be proud of. What I'd like to see, kind of going to your question, Kevin, is how do we leverage these amenities? So we also have the Metro Parks. My wife works over with uh, the Metro Parks team. Uh, she's their lead fundraiser. But um, you know, not everybody has this 110-mile emerald necklace, right, that encircles all these communities of Cuyahoga County and beyond. Um, what can we do to leverage it? I think we ought, in that case, be talking about a brand that's really about a trail city. And you ought to come to Cleveland to experience that trail. I think we ought to brand that freshwater capital, and you ought to come to Cleveland to understand that we went from a river that burned until Carl Stokes said no more, and now that river is fishable, and we can claim the freshwater capital, but enjoy the Great Lakes as ecotourism. So trails and water are part of our brand. And just like we did in University Circle when we got University Circle named the best arts district in America by USA Today last year. You got to sell your, 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 your brand. That's what Destination Cleveland does. I'm, I'm on their board, and we try to sell visits, visits to Cleveland. We also try to sell to ourselves how to enjoy and enhance quality of life. With the Port of Cleveland, uh, ports are uh, kind of a understudied, uh, underappreciated entities, uh, if you're lucky enough to have one. Our port um, is the cleanest transportation uh, medium you can have, cleaner than over the road, cleaner than the air. Um, just shipping generally is environmentally responsible. But we also have this competitive advantage of being the largest eastern Great Lakes port in the US. And we should use that to our advantage. So we did. We started realizing that we could get goods out to St. Lawrence and out to the Atlantic and over to Europe faster than they could out of Baltimore, New York, or anywhere else on the East Coast because there wasn't the traffic. So we set up the Cleveland uh, Europe Express uh, when I was chair of the port, and it was the global connection to uh, Europe. We, in easier days, were down in Cuba talking about uh, Caribbean connections, uh, and we signed an agreement if uh, relations normalized, uh, we would uh, trade with uh, Maribel Port in Cuba and actually create a new Caribbean line. But that's all because of the strategic advantage 
of the Port of Cleveland, which you probably don't think about a lot because we don't talk about it a lot. We should talk about it more, that we're a port city on the Great Lakes and, frankly, the biggest eastern Great Lakes port in the U.S. Okay. So this next question is probably my favorite that yeah. I wrote. So uh, no pressure there. Uh, you had mentioned in previous interviews that I was watching that your father told you to take risks. So how do you decide which risks, risks to take? Yeah. And how hard was the decision to step down from your position at University Circle to begin your campaign for county executive? Thank you. That is a great question, Kevin, both, both of them. Um, so my father, when I graduated from undergraduate college, gave me the most unusual advice. I was walking out of graduation ceremony, and he said, look, go out and make some mistakes. I thought, man, that was an interesting con you know, conversation with my parent. My dad said, go out and make some mistakes. And, uh, but I, say, I remember that to this day because what he gave me was the confidence uh, that it's okay to try something out and perhaps fail. Um, the old operative in business is fail fast. If you're going to fail, fail fast. Like get to it, get over it, and get on with what's next, right? Um, but it really was saying, you know, my dad was saying to me, take some risks. Be bold. Have courage. Don't be afraid to fail. And I still live with that every day uh, to this day. Um, and it served me pretty well. And I think it's stretching the bounds of what we do to take things a bit further, right? Uh, we didn't have to stretch to Europe with the port. We didn't have to go to Cuba to think about a future when relations normalized that we'll do trade, but we did. Um, everything I've tried to do is to try to leverage what we have, but take it to the next level. And, and there is some calculated risk. You did ask about the calculations of that risk. I'm cognizant that as I stand before you hoping for your vote uh, as a county exec candidate, uh, that I don't go out and fail everything for you <laughs> and bankrupt the county, right? You can't do that. But what we can do is think a little differently stretch the boundaries, think outside the box, and not be fearful that if something goes awry, we've completely lost uh, our constituency. I do think what works against that right now is the cynicism of gotcha, everyday news cycle media. Um, it's, it's difficult. Um, it's difficult. News has to do what uh, news persons have to do, which is report the news. But there's also for public officials, a lot of tension right now that you're up against um, the potential of just constantly having media um, say, gotcha, we got gotcha. you. Good example, there's a um, physical facility that's connected to the convention center uh, that was once known as the Medical Mart that the business proposition didn't succeed, uh, it didn't make it. So everybody's out saying now, sell the building, sell it off. Um, we need to uh, you know, move forward and just cut bait. What I've been saying is take another chance at a different proposition because it's part of our convention district. And we're getting a lot of pushback in the public media about that. Uh, but I guess what I'm saying is you almost have to both have the fear of not failing and take some risks, but be willing to be occasionally ridiculed in the news. Uh, I was ridiculed with the lakefront plan when we proposed um, sort of an island reef for Lake Erie outside the shoreline. We didn't build it. Plain dealer ridiculed, called it Gilligan's Island, all that stuff. Milwaukee built it. Milwaukee built that same reef, and they've got activity on it today as a park outside of their city. They took a risk. So you got to know when to take those calculated risks, but you also have to be willing to kind of go up against uh, maybe a media majority that's, that's not necessarily always with you. But I think that's what leadership looks like, you know. Um, you were asking me about University Circle. Yes. How, um, how hard was the decision to step down to run yeah, for county? Executive? It was very hard. Uh, it was very hard. One, we've cultivated um, a city that was growing. Uh, we grew uh, as the fastest growing employment district in Ohio in the first decade of the 2000s. We grew a neighborhood that was growing. And as you grew a neighborhood, you got to know the residents who were moving more into the neighborhood. And you also got to know existing residents who'd lived in the blocks nearby. And um, it was a family. Um, I missed my family. I missed my organization of 65 
women and men who worked with us. I miss our neighborhood block uh, leaders. I, I miss our residents. I miss our concerts. Um, I miss everything that we built. But what I realized is we, we were scaling to a higher calling. And what we started here, we could multiply in other places. And that's kind of what the calling to run was all about, was to do more um, and stretch out from it. But I miss it a lot. And it was a hard decision um, because that, that was my family. You know? And all I'm saying now is let's grow the family. Yeah, I keep extending. Yeah, keep it growing. What is your vision for Cuyahoga County and beyond under your leadership? Um, and you've mentioned yeah. in today already the fresh water and importance of the yeah. Great Lakes. And um, also in past interviews, you mentioned the bridge uniting housing and food yeah. insecurities. Mm -hmm. So how is your vision related to Yeah. You? Well, first of all, what does a county exec do? A uh, county executive oversees 1.2 million persons in Cuyahoga County, and, and we oversee a $1.5 billion budget of federal, state, and local funds that flow through county from federal taxes to property taxes and everything else. We support human services. We support justice affairs. Uh, we support economic development and infrastructure. And there's a new government that was chartered 12 years ago that uh, brought forth a single county exec, essentially working with 59 communities, uh, the mayors, council members, citizens, uh, to sort of take county services and make sure that they're, they're being effectively distributed. But I think also the job is what you make of it. And I want to take Cuyahoga County further as, as a county goes. So our platform is first, let's start with the basics. Um, we need healthy communities, a healthy economy, and a healthy government. We need to make sure that the disparities that are amongst us, uh, that narrow, not widen. Um, so I, I start out just real quick with, let's just talk zero to high school. Uh, there's a massive disparity of infant mortality out there. You guys probably have read about this, know about this, particularly in black and brown communities where moms are losing babies at a high clip to early infant mortality. And we, we can do something about that. We live in the greatest healthcare community in the world, right? Right here. And yet the disparity of a few blocks from those great healthcare institutions, we've got major problems with just infant delivery, right? And a healthy environment for a mom to have a baby. We've got um, real disparity in pre-K. Pre I want universal pre-K to go across uh, that every kid has the shot that maybe you had to have preschool. I want to make sure that vocabulary is developing by age five and that kids have a high command for hundreds and thousands of words uh, in their early stages of, of learning. By third grade, every kid should have reading with comprehension, right? Learning and understanding what they're reading. Um, those are all things that county can play a role in, sometimes sourcing nonprofits who work on that and sometimes creating wraparound education programs after school. So the basics of human health. On healthy communities, uh, we do. We have people, one-fourth of Cuyahoga County households sought uh, food assistance uh, during the pandemic from the Food Bank of Cleveland. One-fourth of your neighbors went to the food bank and sought uh, food assistance. The, case, the, the, uh, the managers of the food bank said to me, give us some of your caseworkers, because somebody comes logically with not just food insecurity. When they have food insecurity, they have housing insecurity. They have other insecurities. So we want to get case managers out working uh, to make sure that our communities are healthy. Speaking of healthy communities, some of our communities have lost population and therefore tax base. And it's not really their fault. In the city of East Cleveland, there was massive exodus, mostly what we call white flight. Years ago, people left, generations ago, left a community to its lonesome to basically try to balance on a third of the population they once had. We need to source some of those communities with strength. That's my, my posture on this. On the healthy economy front, <clears throat> we have some of the globally best things going for us. We have great health care. We have great uh, uh, technology. We have a, a history of making things, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing. And we have the Great Lakes in front of us. What can we do to create innovation and commerce that comes from all of those uh, core clusters? We can do more, right? There's 30,000 small businesses in Cuyahoga County today, 600,000 workers that come from multiple counties. We can leverage off of our core competencies. But the main thing is make sure that in places like this, people are getting the workforce training that they need to be training for those jobs of today and tomorrow. You guys have watched it in your generation. Whole job sectors disappear before our eyes. There used to be food clerks, right? There used to be store clerks. They're, they're, I mean, not saying there aren't anymore, but you go to Target and those people that even in your generation used to work there don't work there, right? At the front, it's, it's all the automation. So what are we training for jobs that will be secure into the future? We need to do it. Finally, on the healthy government, look, there's been a real loss of 
faith and trust in our government, in our county government, in just the 12 years that we've had this. There's bad headlines every day. Um, and some of that's not always the principal's fault. As I mentioned, there's a little bit of cynicism too. But I think we just need to restore that integrity of government service delivery. And back to a healthy government, I want to bring it to people, not have people have to go to it, right? So those are some of our platform initiatives that we're running on. But it comes back to the health of our communities. And the two things I think we excel in in this community is the fact that we're a waterfront community with great health care. So let's make a go of it as a healthy county. I have one final question before we turn it to the audience for their questions. And uh, like in other interviews and earlier today, you mentioned uh, Cleveland Mayor Carl Stokes and his quote, change comes in inches in this town. Can uh, you discuss what that quote means to you, but can you elaborate on his impact um, with your leadership? Yeah, I think that um, sometimes we look back in history and um, uh, you, you've heard kind of the, the phrase, history will judge. I think history in the more recent days has judged Mayor Carl Stokes more of what he should be judged for. Um, I think that the courage to be the first African-American mayor of a major American city and run for that um, was, was really courageous at the front end of the civil rights movement. Um, so I think we need to recognize he and his brother Lou as civil rights pioneers. I think that we need to recognize in the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act, just having passed our 50th anniversary mark, that he was one of the reasons that it came to be. He, he came from Cleveland where the river burned and we were on the magazine of Time Magazine as this burning river city said no more and went to DC with his brother and helped bring about the genesis of the Clean Water Act. Um, I think that uh, that kind of leadership is generational leadership, that the actions that may happen today may not even be recognized for their heroism for the moment they're in, but it might take decades. And I think when we look back, we look at a leader who changed Cleveland in terms of the courage to be out on the forefront of civil rights and the courage to be a better climate steward, and that we now ought to learn from that and further accelerate progress so it doesn't happen in inches. Okay, so at this time, we'll now shift and ask the audience what questions you have for Mr. Ronane. I encourage you to ask any questions. Uh, that you are thinking about. And I ask that you please use the microphone uh, over here to use for your questions. I want to say you had some great questions too, by the way. Thank you. Can I say something while you're passing the mic? I did want to say to um, just our, our, our women scholars who are here, I didn't talk enough about women in leadership. I just want to let you know that I talked a lot about Carl Stokes, but my, uh, my first boss in the public sector was Mayor Jane Campbell. She was the first female elected mayor of Cleveland and the only, and I hope we see successor mayors, female mayors in our future. I'm a big fan of Nan Whaley, who uh, was, is running for governor. Um, she asked me to be her lieutenant governor running mate last time out in 2018. She's done yeoman's work in, in Dayton. But I dedicate this campaign to my mother, who was a woman business owner, uh, who was a financial planner, who broke through an industry that was the proverbial rubber ceiling she was trying to get through. And as trying to get through goes, she said, heck with it, I'm going to build my own business. <laughs> so she built a business that she became a pioneer. And 35 years later, she had uh, the same employees that started with her are still there running her business as she passed on. So I just want to say, uh, it's just something I just wanted to say to you guys. Thanks. So you said about like East Cleveland being a struggling community. Do you think it might, would be possible to annex East Cleveland into Cleveland during your time as executive? Thanks for that question. So about annexation, uh, what I think is annexations will move only at the speed of trust, right? And I think that previous attempts to discuss a consolidation of Cleveland and East Cleveland failed because trust wasn't, wasn't really, there wasn't, uh, wasn't grounded in trust. <clears throat> so this is where lis listener leadership really applies itself. You got to get out and listen to what citizens, council, and mayor want and what they see as a future that could actually work. What you ask is such an important question, not just for East Cleveland and Cleveland or East Cleveland and part of Cuyahoga County, Frankly, it's important for every community in Cuyahoga County because we're at a moment where it's going to get really difficult for some communities. Here's the why. 
Uh, if you weren't struggling already, like East Cleveland financially is, not always their fault, but they're struggling. Income tax is going to get taxed differently. You guys are all familiar, obviously, with remote learning, remote commuting, remote work. Companies are going remote completely. And now municipalities are saying, hey, if you work in Mayfield Heights, but your business is in Lakewood, we in Mayfield Heights want your income tax, right? So that's going to shift the whole landscape, and there's going to be winners and losers. Cleveland gets 60% of its income tax from persons who don't live in the city of East Cleveland. It's called the commuter tax. Well, now those persons hypothetically are lawyers working in Shaker. Shaker's getting the taxes. What happens to Cleveland? We're going to have to start to regionalize and really level set, because if not, we're going to fail, and we're going to fail a lot of communities. And interestingly, Beechwood, Independence, Solon, North Olmsted, any commuter towns, they're a strange bedfellow now with Cleveland. They're all in the same boat of they've, they've had commuter tax that they could lose. It's a whole other subject for a whole other day. But yeah, it's a start. But it starts with trust. You've got to trust across leadership to make things happen. So I actually have two questions for you, if that's OK. Yeah. So they're actually kind of on like opposite I guess, ends of the spectrum. So first of all, I know that there's been talks lately of dismantling Burke Lakefront Airport, which is, if I recall, it's like 250 square acres or something like that of lakefront property. So even though it generates millions of dollars like for the county and for the city of Cleveland, would you support the dismantling and the opening of that waterfront property to the public? Yeah, it's, I, I think, 450 uh, acres. And... Uh, Mayor Daly, who I go back to once in a while, who got rid of Miggs Airport on the lakefront of Lake Michigan, uh, walked East 9th Street with me once. I took him on a tour, and I brought him down to the Rock Hall. He looked over there, and he said, get rid of it. It's corporate welfare. So, wow, okay. Uh, that was an interesting commentary. I don't know if corporate welfare was kind of strong, but his point was get rid of it. But then he went on to tell me that they methodically paid down all the debt for MIGs, that they owed no bills on it, and that they, the bulldozers that you read about in the past that bulldozed at night and took out an airport on the Chicago Lake Line, they sort of had a process to get there. I think we're going to have to apply a process to get there, and I would support, if Mayor Bibb supports, and I think he does, the idea of repurposing the landscape of Burke for public parks and other uses. And one thing we have at the county of the future, if I'm there as the next exec, is uh, we have a county airport which can relieve some of that air service on Burke over to the county airport in Richmond Heights and open up that opportunity for a regional park on the lake. So I think it's working with the mayor, methodically going about this, and looking at an alternative that also works for air service. And I think we've got all three in place to really actually make it happen. Uh, so my second question is regarding property taxes in Cuyahoga County. So right now, um, I know property taxes are ever so increasing, like pretty much by the day, and sometimes it's forcing residents out of their homes where they can't pay it. I know um, your presumptive opponent in the general election, Lee Weingart, supports, supports excuse me, freezing property taxes and stuff like that. So what would you do as county executive to help elderly people who can't afford to, to stay in their homes and stuff like that? Yeah, well, one is on the property tax, uh, any kind of rollback, I think it is difficult to make the math work to say, well, cutting taxes and increasing services. Um, I just think that's a difficult mathematical um, gymnastic. So um, we got to be real careful about what we promise. So I'm not going to promise that yet. Uh, what I am going to say is senior assistance is extraordinarily important. And we never want to see a senior have to make a choice between food, rent, or medicine, right? And that we need to source them with uh, whatever it takes to, uh, to offset uh, costs that they can't absorb. The thing I would be uh, willing to consider uh, with municipalities and with others that draw on those property taxes is, is some kind of conversation about what keeps the senior in place relative to bill structure. Because we do have to, we, we do have to talk with those other partners. Only 4% of the county uh, budget comes from property tax. 18% goes to the county, but 4% actually works to the general fund. So that other uh, 82% goes to others, to schools, to libraries, to parks. And so when you talk about cutting back that tax base, you talk about cutting schools, libraries, and parks. So let's be careful what we pledge before we really know the consequences. That's a direct message to my competitor. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't lecturing you, but I'm no, saying that to him. OK. Um, do you have any plans to Thanks. deal with pollution or climate change? Yes, thank you very much. Um, one, I'm cognizant of the bottle you have in front of you, and I'm guilty of this. Uh, thank you for it, but I'm guilty of it. I would like to get more toward what you're doing. I would like to also think about how we can effectively support 
the, um, uh, the, the bag legislation because I think particulate matter in the water is just not a good thing and we ought to all be focused on, um, on reduction of particulate matter into our freshwater systems. I think that a big issue is dealing with the agriculture system and the algae bloom that comes from runoff. Um, but we are rowing in the right direction. The sewer district is doing yeoman's work to, um, to actually, uh, I, I think, right the wrongs, and they're under a federal consent decree, but of, of point source pollution into the water. So you hear me focusing a lot on water generally as pollution goes, but same goes for air pollution. I mean, there's technology and design solutions that I think <clears throat> have the answers. So we have people with the answers for how to create less em emissions out of uh, formerly smokestack emissions. You know, we have different ways to support alternate transportation uh, and get away from the allure of fossil fuel. It gets difficult when gas prices are going up and all that, but it's nice to hear people talking about literally alternative fuel systems. And I'm a big fan of uh, working with the county, with the pulpit, bully pulpit of the county to say, let's look at a different energy portfolio. And uh, let's, let's lead by the example of how we source our fleet vehicles or our buildings, anything else. You gotta lead by example and then take that example and say to others, hey, it makes sense. The other thing is there's just fiscal bottom line that uh, sustainable practices actually work better in the fiscal bottom line if you practice it. You see people going to zero emissions because it's cost affordable too. So I, we gotta preach from the leadership perspective and lead by example. Thanks. <clears throat> I have a, qu a question. Yeah. I loved your comments about um, leaders are listeners, and you're clearly a natural born leader. You have looked to many ins other inspirational leaders from the past and learned from them. But I'm curious to hear from you about um, your leadership skills that maybe were not have not come naturally to you, and that you've had to learn or work at. What are what are some of those, um, and what advice would you have for uh, young people who are developing as leaders. Yes, thank you, Summer. Well, one, um, <clears throat> I sometimes joke about this line that I sometimes say to my team is that like, impatience is a virtue. But I have to check myself when I say that, you know, the old line, patience is a virtue. You really do have to think uh, in the long view. Um, probably like you, given that you're scholars in this program, you want to see change happen fast, right? Getting back to Carl Stokes and that axiomatic, we've got to get change moving faster. But I am sometimes guilty of moving so fast that I just need to think more about the ultimate long game with progress generally because you can move fast on an issue and in a way if you never listen to any other alternate perspective, you can alienate the person you need in the partnership on the next issue, right? So this all goes back to the idea of what I probably personally need to always focus on is, is the art more than the science of trust building, you know? Because we have trust, we can move things quickly, and that's trust across uh, the, the landscape of Cuyahoga County. Um, <clears throat> so I'm guilty of wanting to move fast, but it's like uh, making sure people are with you along the way, and we're doing this together. Because I think it's that uh, proverb, which I'll probably butcher, but essentially, um, it's, it's essentially if you want to go fast, do it yourself. If you want to go far, go together. Right? So to go far in the long game, we need to go together. Um, so uh, my question would be, uh, I guess, uh, so uh, I went to the, uh, uh, Lee, and Weig uh, Lee Weingart was sitting right where you were, um, and it seems like you both have the same, you know, sort of you know, uh, bipartisan <clears throat> agendas, you know, uh, it's all, it's about the people, not yeah. the politics. So I'm just wondering if you can elaborate on what makes you different from him, what's <clears throat> the, and why I should vote for you instead of yeah. him or other candidates. Well, one, I, I am glad um, that's your observation with, with my opponent because, you, you know, that's what you would hope is that um, whichever side of the quote aisle you're on, you, like I said at the outset, that you can find some common ground and work together. And I pledge that, um, if elected, to work with everybody on no matter what their political ideology is. We've got a, I, I think there's a lot of common ground of just making this community work generally, you know, and the quality of life continue to maintain and or improve it. <clears throat> but the differentiator is, is experience. Um, 
it's, it's the what we've done. Um, I'm not taken away from him by saying this, but he's been a lobbyist for the last two decades. I've been in the trenches in the community at a neighborhood level working in the community, right? And uh, I think it's that old adage, judge us by our work, right? And the work that we do, working with at the Casey University Circle, 10,000 kids a year, realizing when we had incidents of gun violence in the neighborhoods that there was a better path than what I call the hours of eight, nine, and 10, um, meaning three, four, and five o'clock in the afternoon, we found ways for kids to engage after school. We were always searching for civic solutions and implementing them. Um, and I think that that's why, uh, if you're just asking the difference, it, it really comes down to experience. And uh, I've been a chief of staff at City Hall and managed a billion dollar budget. I've been uh, a planning director and envisioned a different future with our community. And I've acted on everything from small business to uh, kids' educational opportunities. Uh, we've been really proximate to our problems, and we've really been thoughtful about our solutions. Thanks. <clears throat> So kind of going back to like some of the economic problems, how would you like solve like problems like infrastructure, <clears throat> economic inequality, yeah. and racial and <clears throat> sexual inequality, mm -hmm. especially with yeah. the new o Ohio bill that's being introduced kind of banning sexual and critical race theory? Yeah. You asked a lot of questions within a question there, but I will say, first of all, we need to own our issues. We need to communicate disparity. We need to be a, a white male, and I'll say, as was said yesterday about white males generally, is we, we've been born to privilege and power that culturally has been given to us through history, and we need to acknowledge women's wage disparity. We white males need to really acknowledge women's wage disparity. And then I, as a future leader, I guess a leader now, but a leader that aspires to employ 5,000 and presumably more than half women, I need to be acknowledging by auditing wage differentials between men and women. Just start with that, and I will do that. Um, secondly, I need to uh, say, Relative to bad state policy that's gone awry, you know, that's policy over the heads of kids that are just trying to learn and their teachers, that we need to be very, very communicative about what our local really looks like. You know, for a legislature to pass a permitless carry legislation and just cavalierly forget that Cleveland had 200 gun, gun homicides last year is dismissing our community. As a future leader, I will go down to Columbus and say, don't forget about principally kids, principally 20 and under, that died by gun violence of those 200 last year, that this is about them, not about your Second Amendment, let me be as free for all that I can possibly be. Let's, let's, let's look at it through the lens of our community. So you need to be a voice, you need to be honest about disparity and history that uh, that's, that's needs to be right coursed. And, um, I guess that's the kind of leader I am. A relative, to, you asked a lot about uh, critical race theory and everything else. I think, I think we need to just put this back to the conversation about what are we really trying to do and who are we really trying to serve? You know, and in a lot of what you said, was, it was about kids and it was about disparity and, um, and, and writing the course. And let's have the conversations we need to have. Yeah. I know like with communities too, like if you go to like Parma here, the population is more like mostly white. And for like a community like Maple Heights or Warrensville and even East Cleveland, the population demographics are more towards African American, yet their income levels are a lot lower than like Parma and other like whitely dominated communities. How would you kind of like try and like solve some of those problems with economic inequality when it comes to income with African Americans and other minorities? Yeah, you, great questions. Well, one is I think we need to be very quickly present to, presenting uh, the case for, for um, why we need to target some of our investments to some of our most disenfranchised communities. We need to map disparity. We need to show on a map 
where there's the highest incidence of infant mortality. We need to show on a map where you've got the highest cluster of returning citizens. We need to show on a map where you have the highest cluster of gun violence. Uh, and, and, and once that, becomes, that map becomes clear, you do see a map of historic systemic racism, right? You know, you, you do see that. And it's, it's, it's difficult and sometimes uncomfortable conversations to have. And I realize that it's, a, it's, it's heavy on us right now as a society generally, it's heavy. But if we don't have this, we just exacerbate the disparity a generation out, right? If we don't have this conversation now. And I do think that we see ourselves now in a time of um, reflection and and again, the murder of George Floyd put everybody in this conversation, and it shouldn't have taken the murder of an unarmed African American man um, to put us here. Uh, it, it just, it did, you know, as his partner said. And now we're having conversations we need to have, and I, I am thankful that we are having that conversation. And as a leader in the future, we need to map that disparity. Now, you mentioned economic development. We got to deal with the issues of economic injustice. I think it's workforce training in places that have not received any training. It's dealing with things like the digital divide, where my kid who lives in the center city of Cleveland has had digital connectivity because our household has devices, we have digital literacy, and we pay for the service. But there are other places where there's been digital uh, divide. And my kid just did a project down, and she's 13, about her colleagues and, and said, my, many of my colleagues didn't even know that this was going on. We need to have a conversation about what's holding people back, not their fault but we need to fix the problem, right? So I would, I would work on that. Finally, I would say for good middle class communities like Parma that we're in today, we need to make sure that we are retooling for a future here too. You know, that, it's, that it's, it's every community needs a future. Walton Hills that lost the stamping plant needs a future. We need to make sure that we're tooling up for the jobs of tomorrow so that we can maintain the middle class in a community like this because we did lose the Brook Park Ford plant and we do need to find out what's next in that very space. And I, I think intentional, thoughtful, uh, targeted leadership is, is gonna be the answer. Thanks. Thank Hello. Hi. So following up with uh, what Sean was saying, um, I am currently house hunting and I also have children and I'm probably the oldest person in this <laughs> audience. And you're still young. So. <laughs> But um, my concern is um, I don't want to live in an area that doesn't have good schools. So when you started the conversation, you started talking about um, educating from, from very young ages. And it, what influence would this role have on helping neighborhoods that don't have good schools become better? Like, I, I understand we were talking about property taxes, and that goes to schooling, and the higher the property taxes, kind of the better the schools. Like, I am not going to be moving to Cleveland anytime soon because I don't, like, I'm coming from North Royalton that has really good schools. I don't want to put my children in that situation. I want to give them the best that they have. So how would you be able to influence that? Well, one, as a county exec that would oversee 59 communities, my goal is to keep you in the county. Okay, <laughs> just that imaginary line that's, uh, that's, that's North Royal Royalton versus North Ridgeville or something. And by the way, we're gonna be a regionalist. We're not versus North Ridgeville, really. We're, we're really um, about a regional prosperity uh, agenda. But as a county government goes, uh, I'm smiling because I want, I want you to stay here and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, we can talk more about options and places. But what my goal is is to maintain the tax base of Cuyahoga County, meaning the people who pay taxes and buy property and pay rents and everything else, it's to maintain you uh, such that we have resources to create greater quality of life for you and your neighbors. Uh, you mentioned, I think, one of the most confounding variables in that, and that is quality schools and what I get for my taxes, right? And what you get for your taxes one community over, you might say, man, I get a lot more. I was uh, a, a child of suburban Bay Village as a, as a high school kid. It was a great, great school system. But it's curious to me that a lot of my generation has gone to Avon Lake, right? And, I, and I've, I've gone inward, eastward to Cleveland, uh, partially because I can, partially because it's just a quality of life choice for me. But um, I don't judge either way. I'm just curious about it. And I think the issue is land's a little more affordable, you get a little bigger house, and you get the assurances of a quality school system. All logical from a parent's perspective, right? 
all logical. But what we have to do is make sure that the core is strong because frankly, my friends in Lorain County do relate and, and rely on the success of Cuyahoga County, right? You need the employment base to be strong. You need the infrastructure to be good. So we're gonna work on continuing to improve quality of life in Cuyahoga County, which includes quality schools, and where county plays the role is everything I mentioned. It's in all the additive wraparound services to make sure kids are ready to learn and that they're ready then to work. And we're gonna work on it and try to keep uh, your taxes at a reasonable level and uh, your school's reasonably strong. Thanks. Um, while you were talking, I just thought of a question. Um, so speaking of like housing, what, is there anything that you would be able to do or push for to um, kind of help like my generation with like minimum wage issues? Yeah. Um, because, you know, I actually had a conversation with my, one of my grandparents and, um, you know, they could live off of their yeah. um, minimum wage, you know, and we cannot, absolutely cannot do that. So is there anything that you would be able to do to help alleviate that? Yeah, I, I think that the, um, the common uh, framework in all of this is a, I mentioned listener leader. You also at some point have to be a communicative leader. You know, you, you listen and then you take what you've listened to and you communicate it. Um, we have had a pretty distant relationship between Northeast Ohio legislative leaders and executives and Columbus, right? You know, you could, we could point fingers at each other and say, they don't get it, we don't get it, and all that. But the bottom line is we have to work together. And I think the other side of this job is communicative leadership. And I'm, I'm a big believer in telling stories with real people about their real lived experiences. My team actually has told me stop putting names to this because it, it, it is understandable, you, you know, there's privacy issues with it, but whether it's somebody who lost a family member to gun violence or whether it's somebody who um, you know, lost a job, we have to tell the story to make sure that that story is in front of those who can help us. Tell you a story, there, there's one other aspect of this, and I think it's meeting people where they're at with a narrative that makes sense to them when I was trying to build transportation options in University Circle and get some state dollars, I had a legislator say to me, we need more badges, less buses. I thought, man, what I really wanted to say to that person is you don't get it, but I didn't say that. Um, I realized that I had to reframe the narrative because that's ridiculous. Badges, buses, they're not mutually exclusive. Yes, you need safety. Yes, you need transportation. Not mutually exclusive. But what if we talked about mobility? What if we talked about his aunt, my stepdad, who's um, sight impaired, who doesn't drive anymore. Somewhere in our family, we're gonna have people at some point in our lives, maybe us, who can't get around by a car anymore. So let's talk about mobility, making sure our family members can get around. So I think the answer back to your question is, you gotta be an advocate. And I would advocate for not only a $15 minimum wage, but I would advocate that a real sustainable wage for let's see a, say a parent with two children is 23 bucks an hour. Now I'm not saying that we go with that quantum leap to 23 right now, but I, I saw a nod of agreement because, but let's, let's, let's talk about the facts. Let's bring foundations that are now doing a lot of work on this subject. Um, and uh, one of them is Deaconess that just recently said a $23 wage for a parent with two children is what really makes sense in terms of family living wage. So. I think we're done talking a little bit about 15, although states gotta bring it up. I think the market's actually climbed up toward that for you know, needs of workforce. Um, but we now need to talk about what's the real wage that we can live on. And then let's talk about the why. If we don't do this, people slip, then there's more needs from a government service to their household, and we're, it costs ultimately society more than if you just supported that extra you know, a few bucks in the hourly wage. And it's also about employer retention of their employees. You know, you put it in their box, what they need is they need somebody they've spent money training to stick around, right? So I'm let's advocate. To, oh, pardon me. I'm gonna yeah. ask just one final question yeah. before turning it back over to Kevin to wrap us up. Um, one of the pillars of the Mandel Scholars Academy is civic engagement and running for public office is obviously one big way to engage in civic life. But for 
all of us who may just beginning, be beginning to engage in civic life, what is your call to action or what are some easy first steps that any of us could take to participate? Uh, that's a great question. There, is, there are so many doorways into uh, civic engagement. Um, I always say to anybody, uh, if, you, if it's possible, uh, let your passion be your job. Let your avocation be your vocation. I've been lucky to have that. I probably could have sought more uh, lucrative jobs or different jobs that do, you know, would just pay more or anything of that nature. But, but I loved city planning. I love cities. Going back to studying cities in undergraduate and loving those cities, that's what I wanted to get into. I never felt like I've worked a day in my life because I love the work I do. It's my hobby, right? Working on cities and, and, and uh, making systems work. So let your avocation be your vocation. If you can make that happen, you'll be a happy person. On the civic engagement side, just walk through any door. Vote. Make sure you talk to other people about the wisdom of voting. It really does matter. Uh, you know, get out the vote, GOTV, that's what we call it. That's what uh, Zoe's language. But, but vote and get out the vote. I think volunteering on campaigns does give you sort of some insight, even if that candidate, you don't agree 100% on everything they're always about, but just gets you involved, it really, really does get you in a mindset of, hmm, we can make change together, we can make change together. And I, and I, I would encourage you uh, to get involved um, on campaigns in the future. The other thing I want to say to you, and I believe this very much personally, it's a, it's a lived experience, is that you don't have to be the elected leader to contribute to civic progress. There's a whole lot of other ways. There's being a staff member, which I've been most, most of my life, to other electeds. There's working on a campaign. There's working on issue advocacy. There's supporting somebody who you think is making the right decision on something. You talked climate earlier. Go check out Sunny Simon, if you don't already know County Councilwoman Sunny Simon. She's done more in, in her job than most anybody else on, on the, of her colleagues. Um, so find leaders that you like and, and hang with them. And uh, the other thing is, <clears throat> I guess I'll end on this, be willing, back to your question, to listen to the other side. Because you don't have to agree with it, but we have really let popular media bifurcate us. And I'm not here to blame the media, but the reality is, is we have let our society get pulled away from one another when we might try to meet people where they're at and find some common ground. Uh, so I just say once in a while, being in a conversation with someone you know you don't agree with is actually healthy you know, for both of you and uh, just something to consider. Um, so let your hobby be your job. Get engaged and uh, listen to other people's voices. Thanks. All and right. listen to your own. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that was a great ending yeah. um, speech there. Um, at this time, I don't have any more questions for you, so we offer you a big thank you for coming out and talking with us. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And I, I wanted to say, if you guys are interested in getting involved with us, to see Zoe or see us at chrisronane.com. Um, we would love, at either side of this election, after or before, to talk more with any of you. On the after side, um, you know, keep in touch with your county government. We are approachable. And I do intend to keep in touch with you. And wish you guys all good luck. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun.